It is another How to Succeed podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, Director of Community Engagement at Sandler. And this week, we're talking about how to succeed at tracking real sales success. The following podcast is copyrighted by Sandler Systems Inc. and protected by U.S. copyright laws. Sandler is the worldwide leader in sales, management, and customer service training. You can find us at sandler.com. And don't forget to click subscribe or share this episode with somebody that you think needs to hear it, maybe on your team, maybe in your family, somebody that needs to know how to track real sales success. We're talking with Jennifer Smith. CEO and founder of Scribe. You can find them at scribehow.com. It's an automatic process documentation software that can help you quickly automate and show other people how to do things. So it's super cool, but she's going to be talking to us about how to succeed at tracking real sales success. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. I think this topic of real sales success is interesting to me because I've been thinking about it for about 12 years now, (laughs) is obviously people look at revenue and are we growing the top line of the company, but I think there's a lot of other measures, especially when you're new or if you have a long sales cycle, waiting until a year when you sell a new hospital or something does that mean you're unsuccessful for a year? Or what about profitable revenue or revenue per person? Or am I happy and fulfilled with my work as a salesperson at the end of the year? There's a lot of ways this could go. Uh, how do you track your real sales success? Yeah, it's a, it's a very timely question because you know I, I get asked by our, our sales team all the time, very rightly so, what does success look like? We obviously have a revenue number, right? We have a revenue target, everyone does. We have a number of deals target as well, right? What does that mean for the number of new accounts that we're bringing in? What does that mean for the accounts that we have that are existing, that we expand? All the things that you would expect, you know, folks to have. Um, but we try to be more more nuanced than that. Um, and I particularly think about it at three levels. There's sort of like, what does success look like for the company overall? Which is like, what are we trying to achieve? What does success look like for the sales team in terms of what they're trying to hit? And then what does success look like for each individual person? And those are three different things, but you got to make sure they all tie together. Um, And so we think a lot about like, where are we trying to go as a company? What is our overall strategy? What are we trying to do with our marketing? What are we trying to do with our product? What's the behavior we're trying to drive in how people find us, use us, adopt us and grow their usage? And then how do we bring our sales strategy in line with that? And then everything else kind of trickles down from there. Yeah, for me, I think, and at Sandler, we've kind of had to learn these lessons too. David Sandler himself said, work smart, not hard, right? That just having more leads or more deals in the funnel or more revenue um, is obviously not the answer as a, a human salesperson because you have limited time, money, and resources to pursue those deals. So most people, and most salespeople anyway, would rather have fewer leads, but higher quality leads coming in so that they spend the most time with people who are going to buy the most amount of stuff and be the happiest customers who refer us to other people. And we don't need more deals that are not going to to close, right? So I think we all instinctively know that there is a quality issue to this or even a, a qualitative thing of like, do we feel better about what we're doing? But it's really hard. I think when we get to measuring stuff, we have a tendency to try to make those needles move on the dial rather than actually, you know, make the experience better for people on our team or our our clients going through. So what do you think is like the ideal attitude of a leader to, um, I guess, propagate this message of, of quality in everything that we're doing rather than just quantity? Yeah, I think about this a lot and I, I will sell, tell my sales team all the time, like, what is the thing that will enable you to go to happy hour earlier today? And that's the thing that I want us to be doing. The message here is not, you know, how do you push and, and you know, like do as much as you can and work as hard as possible. The message here is let's find the path of re- least resistance. What's the easiest way for us to sell our product? And, and we should do that and figure out how to scale that. Um, and so it's interesting. I think there's a there's a mindset shift there. And there's some really tactical things that salespeople can do. Obviously the the leads are somewhat exogenous, right? You sort of get some leads chucked over the fence and you got to look at them and say like, okay, how do I work the ones that I've got? And there'll always be a push. Like, how do I have more, better leads, et cetera, et cetera. But okay. Saying like, you've got the ones that you've got, where do you spend your time? 
what I've found with, with our sales team and sort of sales teams in general is there's often a push to sort of say like, well, let me see if I can get the most that I've got about all out of all of these leads. And so our team would actually track the number of meetings that they would have within a given account and more meetings was a good thing right? It was a sign. I've met more stakeholders, right? I, I'm like expanding this deal. I'm multi-threading, right? We're, we're sort of going for a bigger option here. And I've actually tried to push for the opposite, um, which is not intuitive, but I think goes to what you're saying, which is let's actually do the minimum number of meetings required to get the buyer the info they need to be able to make the buying decision and no more. And so we're actually very transparent like when we go to sell scribe and we'll, we'll say to someone, you know, it's like, what's your process? What's your pricing? We say, we're going to give you all the info you need to make a buying decision today. We don't expect that you will, right? These things take time. We understand we will meet you with your process and, and where you're at, but we're trying to make this really, really easy. Scribe is an easy product to use. Like our job's all about making your life easier. Our buying process should do the same. And so the, the mindset shift for our reps is going from like, how do I work as hard as possible and have as many meetings and engage as much as possible? How do I just give them the info they need? And you know, some people will fall out of the funnel, right? And, and that's okay. They're not ready. Those are not highly qualified leads. And what that means is I'm going to have a really tight narrowing at the top of my funnel, but the ones that make it through are the ones where I will spend the most of my time rather than like kind of working with all of them equally and trying to take them as far as they can go. And so it's almost this mindset shift of like, how do I just be really, really efficient with my time and say, like, I'm just going to spend time with the people who are ready to meet me where I'm at. Right. And, and, and who are, you know, sort of further along and everyone else that's okay. Maybe you come back later. I mean, we have the benefit. We've got a free product. So we just tell people go spend time in the free product, right? It can answer a lot of your questions and, and we're here if you need us and we can help down the road. Uh, I think that's amazing. And this is also where I get to give a shout out to my favorite uh, Sandler success story, a guy named Dale Ball. Uh, shout out to Dale if he's listening. Uh, but he was a roofing salesman and he was doing uh, the year before he started Sandler training more than two, like two proposals a day. It was over 365 proposals for the year. And if you count working days and, and stuff, almost two roofing proposals a day. And he was their top sales rep. So you know, he wasn't, uh, he was working really hard and he was being very successful at it. But after he kind of discovered some of the stuff that we're talking about here, his goal was to cut his number of proposals in half every year and then double his number of sales every year. So he actually kind of had to get, you know, yeah. four times better, or exponentially better. And he did that for six years in a row. So his last year at the roofing company, he did like four proposals and sold $4 million worth of roofs with like two deals. And he said he spent more time in class and more time on the golf course than he did doing stupid stuff for people who would never buy from him. And I thought like, oh, well, that's amazing. And we all kind of instinctively know people that are doing that. And maybe it is the time off. And then there are people that say, well, hey, if I can uh, be that profitable by lunch. Why don't I work afternoons mm -hmm. too? And then I can, you know, go for the gold and work even harder. And that's where I wanted to translate our discussion over to behavior a little bit, specifically because you're the CEO. And I think as CEOs, you do have to be involved in some large accounts and some sales functions, but you don't want that to be, you know, 40 hours a week or your company's going to be in trouble. So how do you decide maybe which deals are the right deals to go into or where you spend your time in sales as a, a CEO and founder? Yeah, we, I mean, our company is all about efficiency, right? Like we build software to help you be more efficient. And so we think a lot about how, what does efficiency look like for ourselves and how we spend our time. And you're totally right that I think we always believe as humans is a sort of logical fallacy that like inputs equals outputs. If I put more in, I get more out. It's actually not the way the world works in most instances. <laughs> I maybe blame our like K through 12 education schooling that teaches us if you just do the extra question on the test, you get extra credit. The real world doesn't work that way, like you were saying, right? And so it's not true that you can spend more time, you know, across accounts and, and get more revenue out the other side. It's all about where do you choose to place your bets and your time and you should get better at time. You should be constantly learning and understanding from the deals that have closed. Okay, what did I learn from those? How can I pattern match? Which ones are more likely to be the ones that make it through my funnel? That's where I'm going to be spending my time and I'm going to spend less time with these other ones. 
that's harder to do when you're talking about these really big deals, like you said, because they take so much longer to close and you have smaller number of data points. And so one of the things that, you know, when we think about how I run my company, like it's very experiment driven and data driven, right? We look at like, what's our close rate? What's our time to close? What's our sales velocity? What's the number of meetings we had? All of these sorts of metrics that gets skewed when you're talking about the really big whales. And so there you've got to look at what are some of the leading indicators, right? Um, not just like the deal closing, because that may take 18 months when you're talking about some of these really big ones. And so for us, it's, um, how do we try to like scope it and tighten and, and have kind of the same signs and signals that we see from some of our higher velocity deals of their likelihood to close. And that means there have been some big companies that have wanted to spend a bunch of time with us where we've said no, or we've sort of said, yeah, we'll, we'll scope it back, right? Less people in the meeting, fewer number of meetings. Um, and, and, you know, you sort of see, and some of them will say, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I was really just kicking the tires, right. I'm not quite ready. And, and some of them will lean in and be like, no, no, really, we're quite serious, right? Like here are the three things that we need. And so it's always incumbent on us to be constantly pushing and understanding, like, where do you stand in your process? What do you need to be doing? Where does this meeting fit in? Cause I think there's such a tendency when a, a great prospect says, I want to spend more time with you to say like, oh, that's great. Things are progressing really well. But that, that's not always the case, right? I've, I'm always surprised sometimes yeah. at buyers' willingness to waste their time when they're, you know, have really <laughs> low confidence in something, but they're willing to spend a bunch of time with you to, to you know, kind of kick the tires. And you as a seller have to say, well, okay, I have limited time too. So like, where do I spend my time? And it should be reflective of where you are in your process. I love that. Sometimes they're working hourly and you're working on commission and those don't line up. <laughs> they want to spend as much time as possible on a, on a project and make sure it, it, you know, it's hundred percent and that that's not your goal. Um, I also wanted to switch and ask you about the other side of it as like uh, an individual here in kind of doing what is most impactful, I think does two things. One it encourages your confidence and helps you avoid uh, burnout and you're doing things that you feel like uh, are worthwhile and not just doing busy work for people or other things like data entry into the CRM and, and other stuff that you can automate. Uh, and I feel like a lot of salespeople struggle with that, that if they really are a great salesperson, they probably want to be dealing with people, not with technology. And so I think you're in an interesting position to kind of help us with that discussion. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole purpose of, of scribe is to make it so people can spend as much of their time doing the thing that is special and unique to them and let's automate away everything else. Right. So what our technology does very simply the browser extension or desktop application, it'll watch you do work and it'll automatically create documentation of what you know how to do. So like, let's say it's something simple. How do I generate my quarterly report in Salesforce? You click record, you generate your quarterly report, you click stop record. It'll auto generate a step-by-step -step written guide with screenshots on how to do that process. And you can use that to share with, you know, someone on your team who's asking a question on how to do something. If you are selling software, you can use that with customers who are asking you, hey, how do I use your product? How do I sign up for a trial? How does this thing work, et cetera? And, and the whole point there is like, you've already done the hard part. You know how to generate that report. You know how to use that piece of software, whatever it is. You should be using technology to automate away all the other parts that still take a bunch of time, but don't really add unique value, right? All of those in this example, like phone calls where you'd have to explain to a prospect, oh, okay, click here. Here's how you go. Let me navigate through or like the email you're writing up to like explain them how to do something. You know, now you can do that in a minute or less, right? And so my whole push is always, Think about the things you are uniquely good at and spend as much of your time as possible doing that specific thing and everything else you should try to delegate or automate away as much as possible. If you are a salesperson, you got into sales because you love solving problems for customers. You love talking to customers. You love understanding who they are, what makes them tick and how you can help solve of their problems and make their day better. You should be spending as much of your time as possible doing that and that alone. And any of this other stuff are things that both fill your time in your day, right? It's time that you're spending not selling. I would argue the bigger cost is even like the energy suck from it, right? Because you you probably didn't go into sales because you love answering all of those emails or, <laughs> you know, like answering questions for colleagues as much as you might love them or like communicating with people in Slack or all this other stuff. 
that you have to do. And, and some of it's necessary, right? And that's fine, but a lot of it isn't. And so my push to both leaders always and then, and then individual people is like, how do you find what all of these like sort of like time suck pieces are and pull them away? How do you find ways to have people spend their time doing the things that they're uniquely good at? Like their kind of special sauce and really leverage that. Yeah, I, I love that so much. And the idea behind Scribe that really a lot of the time, sometimes people don't slow down long enough to teach somebody else to do it. And so when you can automate it like that and then pass it off to somebody else who really enjoys that part of it, there are plenty of people who would much rather fill in a spreadsheet or run a report than do sales calls, <laughs> right? So let's have those people and those personalities that people love getting everything right and checking all the boxes and dotting all the T's and running the reports. Uh, let them do that part of it and let you do what is uh, that you do that creates magic in, in the world. I, I think that just makes a, a ton of sense. And it also just helps us track really what We've been talking about real sales success, really what matters. And, and I think some reports show uh, salespeople are now spending as little as like 20% of their time actually doing sales and yeah, 80% doing shocking. other tasks, right? It's shocking. I mean, we see this, um, I'd say across all knowledge professional sales is probably the one that's most stark because you can really track what percentage of your time do you spend on a call versus not. You know, I spent um, a bunch of years at, at McKinsey as a consultant and they did um, studies on how people spend their time. And they found just the average knowledge worker in general spends about uh, a day a week just trying to figure out how to do their jobs or answer mm -hmm. questions for other people on how to do their jobs. So literally like, oh, I have to enter this thing in Salesforce. Wait, how do I do it again? Can you show me exactly what? Oh, let me Google it. Let me ask someone. You get a ping from the person sitting next to you, right? A day a week. Imagine like, what could you do in an extra day a week of selling time? Not like a day a week yeah. of time, a day a week of selling time, like time you were spending just on the phone, on Zoom the entire time with customers. That'd be, that'd be a huge impact, right? And, and like these opportunities exist. If you take a critical eye to like how you're spending your time in your day, you will find, I call them time vampires. You'll find these time vampires everywhere. And it's, you know, a, a double whammy if you're able to bat them away, because not only do you free up the time, you free up the energy. It's not the stuff that you're good at. It's not the stuff you enjoy doing. Why should you be doing it? So as we get to technique here, let's talk about how we do some of that. And I think maybe start with how do we identify some of those things? I imagine from your position, you've seen your tool used in a lot more areas than we have, or we could imagine right off the bat. Is there anything that you think salespeople should be tracking, should be automating? What are some of the, the key things that jump out to you or for sales leaders and, and owners too about how to really, you know, spend their time doing the stuff that matters. Yeah. So at an, I'll do it at an individual level and then a team level, right? And at, at an individual level, just like look at how you're spending your time. You're working eight hours in the day. How many hours of that were spent on the phone with customers? What do you think is the actual upper limit of how many that could be? Like, how could you get that as close to eight as possible? What's all the other stuff that needs to get done? And I'll give you some like simple tactical things that I, that I've observed with with our sales team is you know, they'll have back-to-back -back calls, right? And then they get to the end of the day and they're like, okay, now I got to go through and do all my follow-ups. And so a follow-up, I'll watch them. A follow-up will take them 45 minutes. I say, why does it take you 45 minutes to write an email that is 80% the same as what we send to everyone, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's 60% the same, right? But it's like, there's, there's similar moments. And it's because they're context switching. So they're having to go back, look at the gone call, try to remember what was that. I'm like, okay, well, why don't you just keep 15 minutes open on your calendar after every call? You can set this as a calendar setting and do your follow-up immediately while it's still fresh in your mind. And by the way, use this template that is true across everyone. And you can just sort of customize and fill in what you need based on that call. Like now we just went from 45 minutes to 15 minutes, right? And like, isn't that a better experience? Because you didn't enjoy that extra 30 minutes anyways. That was an annoying part of your day. So it sounds simple, but you start to add these kinds of things up and, and they really matter. Um, when you think about it uh, across a team, you think about like where are there's repetitive work ha happening between people. And so this is where we'll see, you know, Scribe is an example used across teams. Like how much time are salespeople spending like pinging their sales ops counterparts? Hey, can you, how did I do this thing again? Can you show me? I know you wanted me to do this thing in Salesforce. How am I supposed to be doing this? 
Or how many times were they answering that question for customers? Like, and it, it feels like a quick ping in the moment. No big deal, right? But by the time you answer it, you hop on a Zoom, you email, whatever. And then you context switch back. You've usually lost anywhere from like 20 to 40 minutes. What if you could do that in 60 seconds? What if actually you could now scale that knowledge and like the first time you answer that question, you create, you know, a scribe or whatever it is you're using, like something's like an automated, really quick and easy, took one minute. And next time you get that, you just send that same document. You've now taken what was used to be completely unscalable one-to-one communication and you've turned it into something that's like media or software that's infinitely scalable. And so where are the, these moments where you can now go from like one to one to one, one to many infinitely scalable and you're finding these leverage points for yourself. And a very simple example of that is like, now I have a step-by-step guide on how to do this thing in Salesforce. So like next time someone asks me, I can send them that guide or even better, it's now in our team repository and they can self-serve entirely and they never even come and bother me. That's, a, that's one example, but there are many of those that exist throughout your day. Um, and my push to everyone would be to like, you know, wake up tomorrow and re-examine your day with, with a fresh eye and you will find all of these little opportunities hidden where we just take for granted, oh, that's a way of working. But I, I'm here to say it's not, it doesn't have to be. There are a lot of those things that you can actually take away. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I've been working on this for myself uh, for quite a few years now and Sandler, you know, this is one of our core beliefs and, and philosophies. And I found myself at the beginning trying to optimize my schedule too much. I was planning, mm. you know, 15 minute segments and I was time blocking things and I was trying to become uber productive. And then I didn't have like flexibility, even if I was building in flexibility or, um, I felt like I was draining my own personal energy because I was measuring, too much stuff. And I kind of went back and even where we're talking about making calls. Well, if I do, you know, eight calls in eight hours, um, it may sound more productive, but I was becoming less effective on those calls because I was draining my my batteries too much or I wasn't doing all the follow-up and, and stuff necessary. So yeah. my, my question to you, I guess, is uh, we were going to include some tracking part of this too. What are you measuring or how do you track for your team sales success or what are the key things to kind of make sure that we don't go to any of those extremes yeah we track i care a lot about the process maybe that's not surprising given that that's i great. run a, a process documentation company but you know revenue and deals close is a lagging indicator right and if you've got really long sales cycles that's a that's a deep land, lagging indicator by the time you know you get signal there like you are you've lost a few quarters to course correct and so we look at like much earlier stages and and you can look at things like you know through your pipeline and what does that matter i put a lot of emphasis on qualitative pieces of, of are you learning and getting better along the way do we feel like we are better at understanding this kind of customer do we feel like we are better at understanding their problems, what it means to wake up as them, what they are seeing in their day-to-day, the battles they're fighting. Do we better understand their objections and how we can handle them, right? Do we better understand how our solution fits in and, and like what the sales process looks like and, and always with an eye towards how do we make it more expedient and easier for the buyer to buy and how do we spend less time as a team? Um, there's a distinction between intensity and velocity, right? And companies will often track the velocity, like how, how what's my time to close? That's an important yeah. metric, can be for a number of reasons. But you know what? It's okay for me if my team only spends, you know, two or three calls with a customer, but it's still a three-month deal. That's still a win because that rep can now spend a bunch of time working across a number of different deals. And maybe it still takes three months because that's just the way that customer wants to buy. And they've got a bunch of kind of processes on their side. And so um, I would... I like to push beyond just sort of like the traditional metrics that everyone likes to track and like try to really understand, are we getting better, both more effective and more efficient in how we sell? And that can be in different kinds of metrics, like number of calls, like speed progression between them. Because we have a free product, we look at like, what's the usage of our product during the sales cycle? Are we using that? We have, you have a bunch of tools at your disposal. Only one of them is the relationship you're building through the conversation, right? And so are these other things that we can like lean on and and use through the sales cycle? And so it's quite qualitative. Um, 
but it means we run our sales team more like a growth team um, where we're doing standups and we're meeting and we're saying like, what did you learn from talking to customers? Especially when we're trying something new, right? We're experimenting with a new motion or new collateral or new talk track or whatever. What did you learn yesterday? Like you tried that, let's pattern match. Oh, that worked for you. That didn't work for you. And it's this idea of like scaling across the team because if you work with a team of call it 10 reps, you should be learning 10 times faster, <laughs> right? Yeah. You shouldn't be like a man island unto yourself. You should be saying, okay, we just ran 10 experiments at the same time yesterday. What did we all learn from that? And let's help each other get better. Man, I, I love that philosophy. A ton of great stuff to the air to unpack, but we're running out of time. So I'll just say yes to all of that. And, and the part that I think is, is interesting, obviously, learning and growing, and getting better every day is part of what we do at, at Sandler and teaching people how to, to sell better so they can sell more and, and more easily. But I also wanted to highlight what you said about deal intensity, because I think uh, I heard a great quote one time. I wish I knew who said it, but they said, like, any single metric is a dumb metric be, because yeah. if you look at one thing, you can easily throw off your deal. So if you're only trying to close the fast ones because you're you're trying to increase that velocity or, or velocity or shorten the sales cycle, then you might be list, missing out on really great deals that were just going to take a little bit longer to close. And so I think as long as you're winning big, long, complicated sales cycles, that's okay. And they're profitable deals for you. And so I like that you are um, managing that with humanity and through conversations and through understanding rather than just looking solely at metrics. Because if you look at that without considering the people involved or the deals involved and all the complicated nature of uh, the economy and supply chains and other things, then I think you're missing a lot of context that helps you make the the best decision. So I'll Absolutely. give you, uh, you the last you, word on this one. Anything else on tracking real sales success? You get what you track, right? And so be, be careful what you track in any single metric, like you said, when you take it to the extreme will lead to some really wonky un, unhealthy behavior for the business and for an individual rep. And so I think it's much more about what is the mindset and objective and mantra? And you should be able to like shake any single salesperson on your team awake in the middle of the night and be like, what is it that we're optimizing for right now? And they should be able to tell it to you. And maybe <laughs> there's a few metrics that are leading indicators, right? It'll show up in revenue on the backside. Maybe there's a few metrics that are leading indicators, whether that's sales intensity, deal size, pipeline, et cetera. Um, yeah, that you can be tracking as part of that. But that qualitative element is, I think, really important. Love it. Once again, we've been talking with Jennifer Smith. She is CEO and co-founder of Scribe. Find them at scribehow.com. If you're looking to automate some of your processes and, and save your time and be more uh, effective and efficient with what you're doing, do the stuff you're awesome at and uh, delegate and automate the, the stuff that you're not. Jennifer, I wanted to get to know you a little bit better here in our bio section and ask you a few questions. Uh, it sounds like you're having a lot of fun running your own company now and you, you found success. So I always like to ask people like you, how do you define success at this point in your career? If you've already checked off, you know, most of the, the boxes that you were hoping to get to. Yeah, it sounds cheesy, but, um, I took some time off before I found Scribe, and, uh, I asked myself for the first time in my 30 plus years. I won't tell you how old exactly I was, but 30 <laughs> plus years. Uh, what makes me happy? What do I actually want to be doing? What would I be proud of? Sounds cheesy. What would I be proud of at the end of my career? And to me, it came down to building something that would hopefully endure beyond me and solving a problem that I thought would be really important and would matter to a lot of people. And um, you know, I got some great advice from a professor in business school once who said, find the thing about yourself you're always apologizing for and find a way to get paid for it. And uh, <laughs> for me, I'm obsessed with efficiency. If you were to ask my husband, he'd probably say it's one of his biggest pet peeves of mine. I'm always trying to figure out how do I do three things at once and how do I get maximum, you know, impact with, with minimum amount of time on my side. Um, and um I like am deeply bothered by the way that most people who work nine to five spend their time in front of their computer. And it's because I see that like most people take a job for a particular reason. It's because they're good at something. Right? I take a sales job because I love talking to customers. 
And then they spend most of their time not doing that thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I said, well, what if I could make it so that people could spend more of their time doing that thing? What if I could make it so that people could easily share that thing that they know how to do that's really special with everyone else. What if everyone else now had access to the best of what that person knows how to do? Like, what if we could just up level and share what everyone knows how to do and make it better? And so I just get really energized by that as a mission. And I think about, okay, even if, you know, we say, we say, Okay, but now if I can save a couple hours a week across an entire team, across a month, across a year, you're talking about some really big numbers. Now, if I could do that across an entire company, across a, a workforce, um, that gets really exciting. And so to me, I have found that to be like very purposeful and energizing. Um, but that's because this is what I love to do. This is like yeah. my reason for getting up. What about the opposite of that? I also like to ask successful people what they think their biggest weakness is or their biggest lesson learned or hurdle they had to get over in order to be successful. Yeah. I mean, there's so many of them, you know, where do you choose? I think you're always your biggest, <laughs> you're always your biggest enemy. Right. And so, you know, for me, it's, it was probably like some combination of, um, limiting beliefs. One of our, one of our core scribe values actually is no limiting beliefs. And so anytime someone says, oh, I don't think we can do that. It's well, is that, is that true? Or is that actually a limiting belief? And I think I, I had always believed like you have to do a certain amount to get a certain amount coming out the other side. And so when I saw people having really big outsized impact, I said like, no, like that can't even be possible or they must never have a life or I, you know, I don't know. You tell mm -hmm. yourself all these sorts of stories about why that can't be you. Um, and I think the hardest part for me was like overcoming that and saying, well, no, actually that, that could be me. That could be anyone. There's nothing particularly special about me. Right. Um, it's just because you have a different way of looking at things and a different belief about what's possible. And so you approach something with a completely different attitude and vantage point. And that means you're able to do something totally different and maybe even like sidestep the way that things are normally done. Love that. Do you have a favorite quote? Uh, I, it's a, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's one I think about a lot. Um, Thoreau wrote a, a poem and um, there's a, a phrase in the poem that says, most men go to the grave with their songs still in them. And I think about that a lot because I think it's true and I don't want it to be true for me. And so I think about like, what does it mean to sing all of my song while I'm alive? Um, for anyone who's ever been to like a spin class, I'd say the equivalent is like, if you ever had a soul cycle instructor say like, this is the moment you've been waiting for. There's 10 minutes <laughs> left in the class. Like, give it your all, leave it here in the studio. Right. And you're like, what am I saving my energy for? I think we all kind of have this like, oh, holding back a little bit, not giving it your all. And it's, it's not clear why energy is a renewable resource. Often the more mm -hmm. you give, the more you get. Um, if you're spending it on the, you know, spending your time on the, the things that you enjoy doing. Um, and so I really like that quote, because to me, it just sort of like so viscerally encompasses that feeling of like, just do it all now. What, what the hell are you waiting for? Yeah, I like that one too. There's a, a philosopher, Alan Watts, that I like that, that said like the, the point of life is to dance while the music is playing. Like we, yeah. we only get a, a certain amount of time here. This is your life, right? So uh, go out and, and do what you do best, do what you enjoy, have fun along the way and, and make the most of it. And uh, I think that's a, a great quote, motto to live by. Uh, so Last one, uh, anything uh, about Scribe? So scribehow.com is the, the website. Uh, how can you help us or how can we help you? Um, well, I can help anyone who needs to explain to people how to do something. So you can go to our site, scribehow.com. It takes four minutes from the moment that you land on our site to the moment you are able to create and share a guide with someone. So it's designed to be really, really fast and easy and it's free. Um, there are no limits on it. So next time a customer says, Hey, wait, can you show me how do I do this thing again? Or you want to walk them through your, your product, create something that feels really white glove, but actually only takes you on average 56 seconds per guide. Um, go ahead and, and create a scribe and send it to them. Same thing with a colleague. Um, we'll also share, we've got a, um, a paid version of the product. If you want to upgrade, we'll share a promo code with listeners. If they're interested, use promo code, how to succeed. I'm sure you can share it in the, the show notes as well. Um, but, uh, 
we see a lot of salespeople who will use it to save time and be able to spend more time in their day actually selling and doing the things they love doing and, and use Scribe and other tools to automate away the rest. Love it. Jennifer Smith, CEO and co-founder of Scribe at scribehow.com. Use promo code how to succeed. For more information on Sandler, you can go to sandler.com. Don't forget to click subscribe wherever you're listening or watching to this right now so you get future episodes. And uh, until next time, whatever you are, be a good one. The How to Succeed podcast is brought to you by Sandler, the worldwide leader in sales management and customer service training with over 200 locations. For more information, go to sandler.com. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to click subscribe to get notified about future sales and leadership videos from Sandler. The Sandler Summit returns in 2023. Each new event builds exponentially upon the energy and success of the prior year. The 2022 Sandler Summit event was a huge success for everyone who attended, so don't miss the next one. Buy your tickets to the Sandler Summit at sandler.com summit.